Thanks very much for attending this lunch seminar. Um, it is a lunch seminar after all, so I, I try to keep it very simple and put uh, put in lots of pictures so that you don't fall asleep on me. Um, and it should be a very interesting talk insofar as we're talking or I'm talking about the Sydney Funnel Web Spider, which I think um, yeah, is quite of a Sydney icon. It's my pleasure to be here, um, and I really thank the Australian Museum for making my visit possible. Um, I should have been here two and a half years ago already, uh, but then COVID hit and it became very tricky. Actually, when COVID hit, I was uh, here in Sydney with two of my students and we were collecting funnel web spiders, but then we had to evacuate ourselves and it, it was all very messy. So it feels, feels really good to be back. So today I want to briefly introduce myself and then I will talk about the project I'm doing with staff here from the Australian Museums, actually my friends from the Australian Museum, um, and talk about the Sydney Funnel Web Spider. But then I also want to give a brief introduction to other research I'm doing uh, in Hamburg with my team. Um, what, like Frank said, I'm living in Hamburg these days. Um, and I'm working there as the Museum of Nature. It's one of the larger museums in Germany, one of the big five. Um, and it's part of the Leibniz Society, which is a big research uh, society in Germany, maybe similar to CSIRO here in Australia. And I'm also an associate of uni the University of Hamburg, which is good because I get most of my students from the university. Uh, so this is Hamburg. Um, a northern city in Germany, uh, the second largest city in Germany, is actually a very historical and beautiful city. Uh, and it's also a Germany's port city and trading city. So when you're sitting at the port of Hamburg at night, you get a beautiful view on the harbor region. Um, and it can be very nice unless it's very rainy. And unfortunately, it rains a lot in Hamburg because it's vested right at the Baltic Sea. And uh, it's usually a chill city. There's even a line. Uh, in a song of Paul Kelly about Hamburg. A chill city suits a troubled soul or something like this. Um, but I'm not a troubled soul, so you don't need to worry. So at the museum, I, uh, I'm the employed as the curator for the Arachnids and the Myriapod collections. It's a fairly large collection, historical collection, goes back of the oldest uh, specimens we have are 200 years old, and we have roughly 1 million specimens from all over the world. It's one of the 10 large research collections the museum has. And I uh, accepted that position five or six years ago, moving back from Perth to Hamburg, which was a bit of a culture shock, I must say, but I'm really enjoying my work there. And what you see in the background is me with the oldest collection of Australian spiders outside of Australia. Um, and uh, there are several reasons why we have a large collection of Australian spiders, but we have 600 type specimens from uh, New South Wales and Queensland collected roughly 200 years ago by early explorers in Australia. So I'm very fortunate in my position um, being a curator that I also have a lab of young students um, and this is an ever-changing group. Um, at the moment, I have a postdoc and I have three PhDs and several masters and bachelor students, and they keep me very happy and very entertained. They also keep me very busy at times, but it's a great joy to work with a team of people. And before I moved to Hamburg, um, well, I'm actually a Perth boy, boy. That's what Frank said. I mean, I was born in Eastern Germany, but then for my masters, I moved uh, to Australia and uh, that did the research at the Western Australian Museum. And then for my PhD, I came back. That was a joint project between the Western Australian Museum and the University of Western Australia. So I've lived in Perth for seven years of my life. And after it, I did my PhD, I ventured into environmental consulting to relax a little and developed a lot of uh, field skills and uh, build up uh, management skills and uh, client relationship skills, which helped me a lot in the current role I have. So this is me doing what I like, driving around in the Western Australian outback, collecting uh, spiders and scorpions and, uh, and various other creatures. I also wrote assessments, uh, including snails. So I learned a bit about snails and various other things. So uh, that was one and a half years after my PhD uh, and then I went to Hamburg. So people usually ask me, well, you must be a freak because you're working on spiders, right? And spiders are creepy and ugly and um, and some spiders are. The Sydney Funnel Web Spiders is not the 
say not the nicest spider um, but in fact most of the spiders if you look at them are actually really really beautiful so this is a small jumping spider and you know once you magnify it i mean can you resist these eyes they look at you in a very sympathetic uh, way and actually most of the spiders are very cute once you have a very close look but there are also practical reasons uh, there's been a paper some years back um, from two of my dear colleagues in germany and they tried to develop a model for uh, for insect consumption by spiders, and they figured out using some sophisticated mathematical models that all spiders in the world eat roughly 400 to 800 million tons of insects per year. Now that is a lot, an incomprehensible number, um, but we can try to put that into perspective because the human consumption of fish and uh, meat, including poultry, is roughly 440 million tons of meat. Uh, it's roughly 440 million tons a year. So spiders eat a lot more insects than we eat in uh, in terms of meat. So we can think about how the world would look like without spiders. They wouldn't be a lot for us uh, unless we would like to eat lots of insects. But there are also many other properties which spiders are uh, famous for. Uh, and uh, lots of practical research avenues beyond museum science and taxonomies that can be uh, pursued. And one of these is venom research. Um, spider venoms are a huge source of in, um, information. There is a lot of research activity going into these. Most of the spider venoms are not understood at all. But we have the first pharmaceuticals from ranging from, um, well, artificial Viagra uh, kind of uh, uh, pills to painkillers and all that and there will be a lot more research on this in the future and this perhaps is also important uh, in terms of talking about the or when we talk about the sydney funnel web spider because uh, why would you study sydney funnel web spiders uh, probably because of the venom properties because the males of the species and only the males have the potential to kill humans because they have a particular neurotoxin uh, that interferes with our ion channels and um, works really well in a negative way on uh, primate synapses. Um, but why did I decide to start study funnel web spiders and why um, did my friends and I come up with a proposal on these? Well, it all started four years ago and I think it was one of my first visits back in Australia after I, I went back to Hamburg and um, at the time Bruno Bosato um, we are good friends because we both graduated from the University of Western Australia and Bruno is a behavioral ecologist. Um, and at that time he did his postdoc at Macquarie University. Now he's found a permanent position in Adelaide. So he's a behavioral ecologist, he knows behavior really well. And uh, we caught up in Sydney and we went for beer as you would and we thought, well, Bruno, or Bruno and I thought about what we could do together. And we, well, we drank a bit and talked a bit and we came up with a Sydney Funnel Web Spider. But then we thought, OK, everything would be known already. Uh, you know, this spider should have been studied to death uh, and there shouldn't be a, a lot of new information that, uh, that we could derivate from work. But it turned out that actually uh, when we browsed the, the papers where are, the publications where are, that almost everything is on venoms of these spiders. So there's an awful lot, maybe 20 papers describing all kinds of venom aspects or venom properties in the spider. Uh, but when you actually dig beyond that, then you find that there is almost nothing known about the ecology, there's nothing known about the biology, not even the taxonomy seeds seems to be sound. And when I met Bruno, I was also um, working at the Austrian Museum for the first time with my dear colleague uh, Helen Smith, but also Graham Millich, who is now retired, but also joining this talk. And we were we were then involved with another project I'm not going to talk about today, we still are. But Helen said, well, there's a lot of things going on which we don't really understand. So, you know, we really want to look into the taxonomy as well. And she said, by the way, we have the largest collection of funnel web spiders in in Australia. So I thought, you know, that's great. So let's 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 start a project together involve, involving the Australian Museum and involving various other institutions who have expertise. So 
before we uh, actually describe the project, we need to know something about funnel web spiders. The taxonomy for the spiders uh, was done by Mike Gray, who was former curator here of the arachnids and some of the uh, some of the museum people here st may still know Mike. Uh, I've never had the pleasure to meet him because he retired before my time, but he's published a big revision on funnel web spiders 10 years ago or 11 years ago. Um, and it was a very comprehensive study, but only based on morphology. Um, and he described three species of Atrex, which is the genus of funnel web spiders. There are other genera closely related, but I'm only going to talk about this one. So Atrex robustus is the infamous Sydney funnel web spider. And the way he defined it taxonomically, and there are lots of problems with the taxonomy for the species, is that it's found um, all over the Sydney region, um, up to Newcastle in the north, um, all over the Blue Mountains and then down to Wollongong and the Illawarra region. And then we have two other species. There's Atrex York Manorum, which is an alpine species, and a uh, third one, which is Atrex Savalendi, which is in the uh, well, southern coast of uh, New South Wales and Victoria. Again, we need to emphasize that the taxonomy is only based on morphology and actually only based on male morphology, so mostly pulp morphology and other uh, male features. But talking to various people, and we did that here during my last visit, um, there were lots of difficulties. There is substantial differences in venom composition between populations of what was defined then at, as the Sydney Fundal Web Spiders. And Dave Wilson from the James Cook University has done a bit of work on this, and uh, he emphasized this to us. But also the Australian Reptile Park, who has, who is receiving uh, specimens, male specimens of uh, Sydney funnel web spiders each year, and they milk them for anti venom production. Uh, they had failed mating experiments of field collected specimens, and they had populations that didn't get along at all when they tried to put them together. So there was more going on. And we also, once we started working with the Emory collections, found that the morphological variability within the species is ex extremely high, uh, more than that is expected. So we thought, OK, so, you know, why not retesting the species based on morphological grounds? And we came up with two research questions. So my question was, is the Sydney, so my, in like our team question, but this is something I wanted to tackle. Is the Sydney funnel web spider really one species or is it a rather complex of species and needs redefinition? Um, and Bruno came up with a different question. It's a behavioral question. So you really want to know what male funnel web spiders do because uh, they are the ones that can cause, well, can kill people. So you want to know how the animals move, how they disperse, when they disperse, how far they roam and so forth. So we came up uh, with a project uh, basically tackling these two questions. And we got funding from National Geographic and also here the uh, museum and Australian Geographic and some other sources to do so. So one thing we didn't really know where to find funnel web spiders. So Bruno and I were both Perth boys and uh, there are no funnel web spiders in Perth. So we needed to figure out where to find these spiders. And so we did our field work. And this is a photo I took two days ago. Um, I'm out with Frank in, in the Sydney suburbs. This is a classical habitat. We are in a deep gully uh, in a dry sclerophyll forest. It's red and there are lots of rocks. And if you're turning the rocks, you find these funnel webs. So at night, the, uh, the spiders, this is like the funnel is between rocks usually and it opens between the rocks. So this is where the spider would sit during uh, at night and search for or actually wait for prey to, uh, to eat it. Uh, and uh, at night, they retreat in these uh, um, holes that can be 20, sometimes even 30 centimeters deep in the ground. Uh, and also in winter now, so we're trying to collect these spiders in winters, but actually quite difficult because they're sitting in, in the uh, tubes and they're quite inactive. So they can be quite common in these rocky uh, habitats, but they're usually associated with gullies, unless the habitat is really suitable and they venture out of these gullies if humidity is high. So we found them and when we tried or we started to collect them and they're not the most 
peaceful spiders, we need to say. They are quite aggressive. So when we dig them up, they usually get into this uh, threat position where they raise the head region, display the fangs, and uh, you can see in this spider here that there's even a drop of venom emerging from uh, like at the tip of a, a fang. Um, the, mass, the venom gland is massive, and so you really don't want to get bitten. You don't want to get bitten by a female either because they, they have a lot of biting force also. So the first experiment we wanted to do, and this was more Bruno's job, uh, but generally our pleasure, uh, was a tracking experiment on male funnel web spiders. And the idea was to glue little trackers, which we bought. Um, they're quite expensive, um, but you can get them. And uh, the idea was to glue them on male funnel web spiders and then track the spiders at night in the field and also during the day because we wanted to see how far the animals roam. So is it two meters at night? Is it 20 meters at night? Is it 100 meters at night? It's important to know that because, you know, they get into contact with people. So the male spiders uh, are the dispersal stage because they, they search for females in summer and uh, they search for female burrows and this is when they roam. And this is also when they get into houses uh, or into gardens and then cause uh, trouble. So in our field experiments, we I had two of my students at the time, Svea and Ricardo with me, and uh, Bruno had uh, Braxton as a student from Macquarie, and we were out uh, all night collecting these spiders and uh, trying to put the little trackers on. It was a steep learning curve, I must say. And maybe there's a video here, we have caught a male funnel web spider, so at night you're basically in a national park and you're walking around and you're, you're flying the spider. And while Boone is talking, I don't know how to, uh, uh, well, doesn't matter, we just leave it and he's taking the tracker out and we're trying to get this tracker onto the spider. So one thing we didn't know at the time is that you need a special glue for that because the glue we had wasn't good enough and we had several trackers falling off. And the other problem we had was to immobilize the spider because male funnel web spiders are quite aggressive and they don't like to be pinned down. So uh, they will try to bite you and uh, we tried several things and I think Bruno then uh, started using um, CO2 for narcotizing or narc narcotization of the animals and this is when you can put the tracker on. This is how the male spiders look like when you well, when, when you've done a good job. And this is when you set them free and you can track them uh, overnight and also during the day uh, and you can kind of get an idea how far the animals roam. And once you have a representative sample size, size you have an idea what the males do and uh, when they do it and how they do it. So it was a steep learning curve in so far also as uh, we had some fallouts with geckos uh, where was one story where a gecko had actually eaten one of the funnel web spiders and put out the tracker. So this is how we figured out that geckos also like to eat funnel web spiders, which is, surprised us, but it seems that they do. So it's a learning curve. Um, and then COVID hit, we had to give this part of a project, or not, we, we didn't give it away, but we involved uh, collaborators from the University of Sydney, I think on New South Wales and there's now a PhD student uh, here, there. She is continuing this work because I had to go back to Hamburg and Bruno started a job uh, elsewhere. But it's still going on, so I don't, I'm not going to talk about the results here. But I think they're going to be interesting. What we did uh, with the field collected specimens from our last field period, but also specimens we were given from uh, the Australian Reptile Park, but also from the museum here. So this was the first part and um, Beyond that, in Hamburg, I mean, we're doing various things. Uh, in my lab, I've defined three areas of research, um, and there are lots of different projects, international projects mostly, in these three areas of research. One of these is ecosystem dynamics and change. The second is biodiversity documentation, and the third is evolutionary processes. So just in order to give an idea of what that is, I will introduce one of the projects briefly. In terms of the ecosystem dynamics and change processes, we have been lucky enough to be involved in a very big uh, project that the German Research Council, DFG, has funded and is still funding and uh, that tackles uh, all aspects of uh, anthropogenic landscape change in Indonesia, here in Sumatra. 
The question is what happens with biodiversity, but also climate and humans as the rainforest in Indonesia is being transformed into oil palm plantations. We know that in Indonesia, this is a huge problem with deforestation rates in Indonesia are amongst the highest in the world. Java is already a giant paddock and Sumatra and Borneo are on a very good way of becoming paddocks too. So the DFG is pouring lots of money into it and we did our part in terms of the spiders. So we've collected with our friends from the University of Göttingen who are ecologists, uh, spiders in uh, two provinces in Sumatra covered with uh, rainforest, but we also sampled in rubber uh, plantations and uh, oil palm plantations and we came back with buckets of spiders and mostly unidentified spiders, which you, uh, because the taxonomy is so poor in Indonesia, we haven't, we never had a, um, an arachnologist in working in the country. So all of this is basically colonial uh, status quo of taxonomy still. So we developed um, a barcoding workflow, an automatic barcoding workflow, and we've done the same in uh, Ecuador recently for, uh, for basically delineating uh, potential species at a molecular level so that we get an idea of what we actually have. This is also important because in field collections you're getting lots of juveniles and you cannot usually identify them in at least in spiders to species level. So we got an idea of what we have in terms of sort of taxonomic composition. Um, but then we wanted to know what happens to the spider community as the forest is being transformed. So we did family identifications and species identifications. We assigned these spiders we got to the various landforms, uh, ranging from forest to jungle rubber, rubber plantations and oil palm plantations. And we tried to uh, well, come up with traits for all these uh, spiders, which was actually quite difficult to do. For example, you get small spiders that live in leaf litter, they're not heavily sclerotized, they build small webs like the left one here in an apid. But you're also getting free ranging hunters, which sometimes are very colorful uh, and you get them in the canopy of the forest. And so you're getting jumping spiders here, they are visual hunters, they don't build webs at all. And then, uh, and I usually work in my lab with in a very collaborative manner because as a museum we have a taxonomic and systematics aspect, ex, uh, expertise, but we're not ecologists. So we teamed up with the University of Göttingen and um, what we found is not surprisingly um, a reduction in um, species numbers and species richness as the rainforest here in green is being transformed into rubber plantations. So this is blue and uh, um, red and then to all palm plantations which has by far the lowest diversity that was expected and is very trivial but you still need to show it but surprisingly uh, the whole community changes and this is a complex figure and i don't want to explain it in detail but i can tell you that the, the, the community of spiders at the taxonomic level and also in the trade level you have after the forest is being transformed is entirely different from what you had in a rainforest there's a complete turnover and we found that there are some traits that emerge uh, and shift a lot uh, in during this transition from rainforest to oil palm. For example, coloration of species increases. So in the rainforest, you're getting uh, uniformly colored specimens. They're so usually brown or black or, or you know, so very dark colors. But when we open oil palm plantations, you're getting lots of colorful species, lots of jumping spiders and so forth. So that seems to be a common pattern, but also the hunting strategy of a community changes. So in forest, you're getting lots of um, web building spiders uh, and in the open um, plantations, you're getting uh, lots of free hunters. So in terms of uh, trade analysis and community composition, we find that forest traits are diminishing as the land is being transformed and new traits emerge in this community. So what that means in terms of conservation, um, I cannot really tell you because it's one of the studies of many studies that we are doing, uh, but it's the first results on spiders actually describing what happens to, uh, or one of the first studies actually describing what happens in such, uh, such a habitat that's being transformed. So moving to the second aspect, biodiversity documentation. Um, this is our core discipline as a museum. This is what we do really well uh, at every level. This is something universities don't do uh, or don't do very well. 
usually we are discovering and describing many new species each year still i mean i'm working in germany now there are not many species to be described but we're working in so many countries and we assist these countries in documenting their diversity now sometimes taxonomy is seen as being very dull and boring what well, I, what i usually do is i try to uh to come up with a nice story that um that connects our science with the perception that people have or a story that people like. So some years ago, you may have heard about this one. I came up with my friends from the Queensland Museum uh, with a story about the Bob Marley spider. It's an intertidal spider. My dear colleague Robert Raven from the Queensland Museum found this um, in intertidal habitats in Queensland some years ago. And this spider survives flooding because it uh, weaves silken tubes in uh, the coral. And um, so I came up and I thought, well, you know, we have a high tide, low tide song of Bob Marley. So why don't we take or we don't, why don't we generate a story? And that worked really well. The species is ranked amongst the 10 top marine species in 2020 or something like this. So uh, that worked. And uh, another press story I did some years ago was on the Karl Lagerfeld spider. Actually, also both of Australian spiders, because it's Australia is kind of still my second home, um, if not my first home. Um, so this is a beautiful spider here also from New, this from New South Wales, it's a jumping spider and it had a color pattern that is very similar to uh, the fashion designer Karl Lagerfeld who, uh, who was born in Hamburg. So I think that uh, that was not such a popular story in Australia, but in Europe it was, that was a big story and you know I, I was on TV shows and all that and could feel very important. Um, so that was fun and we're trying to do this just to promote our science in the community. But we're also documenting diversity through time. So we're not only working on recent species, we're also working on fossils. I'm currently having a postdoc working on this and we have a project funded by the German Research Council looking at amber fossils. And amber is a fossilized tree resin. It's not very commonly found in Australia, but in Europe you're getting Baltic amber, which is found all along the Baltic Sea coastline. Um, and is found usually after storm floods um, and you can search for it here and you find beautiful amber pieces that you can turn into jewelry unless there are insects or spiders in there and uh, then you can kind of have a scientific attitude and look at this. So all of these amber pieces are supposed to emerge in the so-called Baltic amber forest, which was a warm temperate forest that thrived in the Eocene. So 40 million years ago when the temperatures were three, four, five degrees higher than what they are today. So what we are trying to do is document to document the fauna really well, at least as far as the arachnids go, but also then come up with some trait analysis and biogeographical scenarios, what actually happened to this fauna when the ice ages hit Europe and Asia and basically trans trans transformed these forests into, well, uh, well, a desert of ice. So what we find in these embers is lots of arachnids. There are lots and lots of arachnids, but lots and lots of insects, but they're usually tropical lineages or warm, warm temperate lineages. So very different from the cool temperate uh, lineages that we find in Germany and Denmark and, and you know, the Baltic countries these days. Um, so we get them for, uh, and we, we collaborate with private collectors here a lot. So it's again, it's a bit of a citizen science project also because so many people are involved in donating specimens. But one of the problems we have, if you want to describe this fauna, but also if you want to assess it and you want to come up with some analysis on this fauna, you often find that preservation modes are really, really poor. So this is a pseudoscorpion. So this is kind of a relative of a scorpion, but it's a, a tiny animal, only one to two animals. And this one has been preserved in a piece of amber. And you see there's lots of stuff in this amber and this pseudoscorpion is lying on a fly or trips. I don't really know what it is because I'm not an entomologist, but I know I cannot see all the structures that I want to see in the pseudoscorpion. So what we did two or three years, no, actually four years ago, so we started a collaboration with the German Synchrotron Center in Hamburg and my dear friends uh, Jörg Hammel, who is leading uh, the biological section there, and also paleontologists is involved, my dear friend Ulrich Kotthoff, and we developed protocols for scanning amber pieces, specifically Baltic amber pieces using synchrotron radiation. So we went to the DC, so that's the name of it, and it looks like high-tech German Technology is actually very impressive if you go there and I don't know, I'm a biologist, so if I go there, I get really confused and almost anxious with all the technology there is, so it, it looks like that everywhere. 
but importantly you have photons that are uh, well basically accelerating or high they have an extremely high energy density because they're accelerated in tubes and they're kind of emitted out of this tube and uh, if you put your little amber piece there and you rotate it uh, and you, you shoot the photons at it you can derive wonderful three-dimensional models from these so this is what we did so it's our amber pieces and it was quite difficult to develop a protocol but we're really good at it now i think and once you model the synchrotron data and this is what my students usually do in bachelor or master thesis you come up with models like this so this is our pseudoscorpion uh, and you can now look at the uh, ventral side for example which you couldn't see before you can zoom in zoom out so this is a rough model for kind of this presentation but you can also color it and you can see various structures that otherwise you would not be able to see so we wait for this to stop so you have this tiny animal it's only two millimeters long and this is the abdomen so the, the rear part of the body and you cannot see much because there's all kinds of translucent artifacts there but once you actually zoom in you can see all the spines you can see all the setae you can reconstruct the fossils really nicely and you can compare it to the recent fauna or you find that it's a extinct form or something that you cannot find in Europe these days anymore so we work a lot on these so just to make a case that diversity documentation is also not limited in time it can also be done for the past using paleontological approaches and modern technology so the third and the last part of my talk is another two or three minutes uh, and then I hope I didn't or we can ask going to the question part of uh, this presentation is evolutionary processes so i want to go back to australia now uh, i worked a lot of my life uh, and research career on pseudoscorpions not just spiders pseudoscorpions tiny animals they're relatives of scorpions uh, and but they are only two two four millimeters long and they lack the sting of and the tail and they're usually found in leaf litter, but also on the tree bark. Some of you, so this is the usual size and mostly the animals are even smaller, but I like them a lot. Um, some of you may know the book scorpion. Uh, this is a species that we usually are often associated with beehives and they like to live in beehives because they feed on varroa mites. So now Australia is the last continent in the world that is not, does not have varroa mites. Uh, but it's just a question of time before they also get to Australia. And this pseudoscorpion eats the varroa mites. Um, and is, there are lots, there's lots of research actually going into this species at the moment in terms of captive breeding protocols and trying to use it as a biological control agent for the, the, varroa, the varroa mite. But that's only one of the species. Uh, in my PhD, I worked with another lineage of pseudoscorpions. It has a horrible name, Pseudotyrannicophonidae. It's terrible. That's a very ancient lineage of pseudoscorpions, and it's in Australia only found in mesic forest systems. Uh, so the animals need at least 800 milliliters of rainfall a year. Uh, higher is better, lower doesn't work. And in southwestern Australia, it's obviously this is a biodiversity hotspot. On the right, you can see all the extent of land clearing there has been in southwestern Australia. So these, the green here, are the last forest patches. So here you get Jarrah forest and here you get Kerry forest, both are eucalyptus species. So I wanted to know what actually drives diversification and um, evolutionary processes in this diversity hotspot. So I sampled these pseudoscorpions for three or four years and actually quite tricky because they're really, they're quite rare and you need to know where to find them. And the white line here in this picture delineates the, the high rainfall zone of Western Australia to uh, the rest. So more than 800 milliliters of rainfall to the east where it gets a lot drier. So I sampled these for three years. And then, well, what you do as, as a museum scientist, you're, you come up with a molecular phylogeny. This one here was six genes. Uh, and we find that, of course, there's a lot of unexplored biodiversity. Only one of these species had a name, but there are many, many others. But what surprised me when I did the sequencing is that all the species are quite old. If you're looking at, uh, at these clades, this, uh, they're all quite old. This is, these are the ages here in millions of years. And you see diversification occurs between 10 and 20 million years. So I was interested to know why this is actually so. 
by the way, we get population structure here as well. That's a bit younger. So why this is so? And I did a lot of reading coming from, you know, Germany to Australia and not knowing so much about uh, what triggers diversification here. And one thing I found was this very strong correlation between diversification and splits in the phylogeny and the global temperature curve. So in red, you find the global temperature curve from the Eocene um, down to the Pleistocene where we are now. So and this period here, 20 to 5 million years ago, is the Miocene. And in the middle Miocene, we had a temper temperature optimum, a global optimum. Temperatures were a lot warmer than they are today, but w within uh, a million years, they dropped dramatically um, by almost four to five degrees. This is when the Antarctic and circumpolar current was established. And what we see in the phylogeny that every time the temperature drops, so here we're getting diversification event, here we're getting major diversification, here in order to generate population structure, you also need a drop in temperature. This seems to be a correlation, and I, I thought about this and uh, read a lot about the botanical history, but also the geological history of southwestern Australia. And what happened is that you had increased aridification processes that affected all of Australia, then, but particularly western Australia, um, and are still going on. So the cooling caused uh, aridification or was coinciding with aridification in Australia, and you had Nophophagus forests that were still abundant in uh, Western Australia until the Pleistocene, uh, the Pliocene, so three million years ago, turned into deserts. And I think that has caused a lot of habitat fragmentation and animals or the species basically persist in refugia these days and they speciate in these refugias and they can't venture out of these music refugia where you find them in the landscape. So I think this is a consistent pattern in Australian biota. And Southwestern Australia was was one story, um, but you know, if we think about what happened, or maybe also before I go to Eastern Australia, um, making the case that based on this and knowing the evolutionary uh, pressures that exist on fauna here in this hotspot, you can also think about the future. So I did a bit of modeling here as well, coming to the conclusion that uh, with rising temperatures in this model, this is a prediction for 2050 and this one for 2080, you have get a lot of habitat loss for the species where, where they still are. Basically, you get decreased rainfall and higher temperatures and the animals don't like high temperatures and they don't like um, low rainfall. So red is the area of loss that's been calculated and uh, blue is the area that has beaten or the habitat that will be maintained. So we know that models are usually rough distribution models um, and um, ecological models, but they give you a certain idea what could happen. And if you want to derive conservation incentives based on these models and what we know about the evolution of the lineage now, we would come to the conclusion that species here in the Darling Scar, for example, they need to be protected first and foremost because they will face a very tough time. Whereas here in the Cary Forest, uh, conditions will remain more stable. So you can use evolutionary biology and your knowledge of the past also to inform the future and use this for conservation measures. So this was Southwestern Australia, very easy. I've also sampled this lineage all across Eastern Australia. So red are collections I have made and white are museum collections, including the Australian Museum collections. Usually you find the animals here in these uh, yeah, wonderful music rainforest systems with tree ferns and you sift the tree ferns and you find them. And I just want to show phylogeny is still not published because it's complicated, but it's still growing. And it's very confusing. Southwestern Australia behaves like an island biogeographically. It's it's easy. Patterns are a lot more complicated in Eastern Australia. I see a lot of clades and sometimes they correspond to biogeographical barriers like here the Hunter Valley that delineates a uh, clade, a yellow clade here from a green clade and then the border ranges, they also seem to be a biogeographical barrier. But there's lots and lots and lots of undescribed species. There's lots of things I cannot resolve yet. So that's it's an ongoing project. But you see, there is a lot of work to be done. And this is something I still want to do uh, in Eastern Australia. New South Wales has a very diverse fauna of pseudoscorpions. And that in order not to bore you any longer, I want to thank three people in particular who've made my stay here really comfortable so far and are great friends of mine now. Frank, um, 
where Frank sits, sits sitting behind me and he still needs to drive me around to uh, to to all these field sites tomorrow. So, you know, Frank, you're great. And Helen, of course, a wonderful friend and colleague, and she's been very, very supportive of all these projects. And we have lots of field, uh, fun in the field together. Unfortunately, she has an operation soon, so this time there's no field work. And Graham also, who's now enjoying his home office and retirement, but should be back at the museum um, as a volunteer or an associate in the future. And with that, I want to thank you all for listening during your lunch break.